Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back to the channel. This is the second interview that we're carrying out as part of this interview series during the coronavirus lockdown today. I'm joined by Maria, who is a first year PhD student and research scientist at the University of Birmingham. So today we're going to take the opportunity to pick her brains on PhD life, what her area of expertise is, and how you can get into research as a student and potentially how scientists are being affected by the ongoing um crisis maria thank you for joining us yeah thank you for inviting me um would you like to just give us the quick lowdown who are you what do you do yes yeah, so i have been at university of birmingham for about seven years now so i did my undergraduate degree there uh in biomedical science right. and yeah. after which i uh took a year out i worked for a year in a cancer clinical trials unit so i worked as a data manager on a national lung cancer trial and then i decided to uh, return so that wasn't in the lab so that was an office-based job and after which i decided to then go back to research and do a, a master's in uh, cancer sciences mm -hmm. so the master's that i did is an mres so there is mres and msc courses so mres yeah. is the course that has got uh, a big research component to it so i did a laboratory project there uh, in cancer immunology field um, and then after that i went on to do um, so I took on a post as a research technician in one of the cancer immunology labs at Birmingham as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was uh, in cancer immunotherapy field. And that then sort of, I, I stayed there, continued um, to do a PhD in a different lab, but also in the cancer immunotherapy field. Sure. So yes, here I am now doing a PhD um, in my first year. God, so you've really been through the various levels. Um, yes. Is that, that should trajectory that you've taken is that a fairly standard for someone who wants to do a phd um so it varies a lot some people manage to get onto phd programs straight out of their undergraduate degrees um it's really competitive though so um usually people who get on such phd programs they include like a master's year in the phd yeah uh, but yeah you have to be academically quite high performing student i think to get straight to the phd after your undergrad uh, cool. but most people tend to do some kind of a master's or and or work afterwards um yeah so i've got i've had friends who've gone kind of undergrad masters phd straight away whereas yeah. i wanted to have a year out of education just to work sure. so uh after yeah i applied for a couple of phds they um i didn't get those but then i found a supervisor that i really wanted to work for and his field really interested me so i decided to kind of wait until he has the phd funding and the position so that went hands in hand with you know applying and helped me a lot with getting the phd Fantastic. So then I guess we we come down to the, the, the golden question. Um, what is your PhD in? What's your what's your subject of interest? So, yeah, I, my PhD is in cancer immunotherapy field and I'm looking at uh, how we could use uh, a particular type of immune cell called gamma delta T cell mm -hmm. in targeting cancer and how we can use them for immunotherapy by stimulating them with different compounds and engineering them into something called chimeric antigen receptor or CAR T cells, which is something that's now approved in the NHS for treating um, blood cancers, uh, such okay. as leukemia. But uh, what we're going to try and look at is if we could use gamma delta T cells for also targeting potentially solid tumors because they, these cells can, you know, home into tissues and um, that we could use maybe that maybe we could use that property for targeting solid tumors. I say I, I have a cell biology degree and most of a medical degree under my belt and this still means nothing to me. Yeah. So, so what um, these gamma delta T cells that you were yeah. talking about, what what makes them special as, as it were? Why are they different to the T cells that I might have come across in my training? Yes. Yeah, so I think a lot of the times these cells are kind of skipped over or brushed over in uh, even in my undergraduate degree we never actually covered them so i came across them through reading other literature and sure. through my supervisor when i met him um so these t cells they don't work the same way that the classical t cells do like the ones that you would have studied about so they the way they recognize antigens is very different um mm -hmm. 
because they're not as restricted to the, you know, so normally the classical T cells need certain complexes to present the antigen to the T cells. But uh, these gamma deltas, they don't require that. So they actually, they're less limited and less restricted in that sense. Okay. So that makes them quite ideal for kind of cancer targeting. And um, also, yes, like their tissue homing capacity, so they can live. There are subsets which basically reside in the blood. It's some subsets which are more tissue resident. So like, I don't know, in colorectal tissues or in, uh, I don't know, lung or in your skin even. Um, so yeah, we could use all those properties to develop them into, you know, crazy cells that can target and kill tumors, basically. So that's, that's what I'm going to try and do anyway. So it's kind of been tried before a little bit, but not in the context that I'm doing. Is that in, in dealing with particular types of cancer? Yeah, so we are focusing initially on bladder cancer because that's something uh, that's just the group has been working on that uh, before sure. I started. So that's kind of, you know, it's going towards that. And also bladder cancer is responsive to uh, things like BCG vaccine. And sure, yeah. that vaccine stimulates gamma delta T cells. So uh. that's kind of another reason why we thought, okay, we'll stick with bladder cancer model. But we will also look into other tumors, so uh, maybe colorectal, um, ovarian cancer potentially as well. Um, but again, it kind of depends on you know the data that we get. So at the moment, it looks interesting in terms of bladder cancer. But okay. yeah, it's I'm in the first year, so I've got three more years to work. So we'll try and to go along. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Um, so that that all serve as our segue. So we, we've been sent in loads of really good questions um, yes. from people on, on various social media channels. I think that the most prescient thing to ask is why, why did you decide to undertake a PhD? Yes. Yeah, so I, so during my undergrad, I, so when I went into my undergrad, I didn't actually want to do biomedical science. So I think this is one of the questions that I've seen is, did you ever consider medicine? Yes. I actually wanted to do medicine to begin with, uh, for which I uh, was unsuccessful, but I got an offer for biomed degree at University of Birmingham. Sure. And at that time I thought, okay, it's quite similar to medicine. Well, it's got medicine components in it, but it's sure. not, you don't have a clinical aspect. You've just got the scientific component there. But I didn't know what research science was about. You know, it's something that you hear or read about in the news, like scientists discovered this or they did yeah, this. Yeah. But I had no idea how or what they did. And then during my biomed undergrad, I've done some laboratory placements and I discovered the lab science essentially. And I really, really enjoyed that. So yeah. I really enjoyed you know, the hands-on experience with the labs. I enjoyed setting up experiments, getting data from that and kind of directing research based on what data you have. There's a lot of problem solving yeah. there. And um, yeah, so after, so after the biomed, when I did the master's as well, that I spent a longer time in the lab because in biomed, you usually spend like, a few weeks in the lab, which isn't really, it's enough to get the gist of things, but it's not enough to get a full, to, you yeah. know, uh, understanding of things. And if you want to do something in the long term with the labs. Uh, so yeah, the master's really helped. So I spent about nine months in the lab. So after all this experience during my master's, I thought that I really like the idea of working in research uh, as a career. So um, that's what, you know, if you want to work in research and if you want to have your own lab and be yeah. a lecturer at university, you have to have a PhD. So you won't really progress anywhere without a PhD. And also I really wanted to do, you know, PhD is your, basically it's your training in research. So you get to learn, you know, how to generate ideas, how to direct your own experiments. And, um, I really like that idea that you're a student, but you're working in a lab so it's not the same kind of student as you are when you're an undergrad for example so you don't have any exams there it's full-on hands-on lab work and i really enjoy that you know like i said multiple times now i think that hands-on is what yeah I really yeah enjoy. what you want oh it's, it's interesting because i feel like I, I chat to a lot of medical applicants obviously and often the the hands-on application of science um is is one of the uh when people are asked that question, you know, what, why do you want to do medicine? Why do you want to be a doctor? That that's often the the line that they will flout. It's like I, I like the application of my science in a hands on way, but actually, from what you're saying, mm. it sounds like that's potentially just as valid in the lab. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, I mean, medicine. Yes, it's hands on application of science, but also it's fascinating to be 
in the science field that would then i.e. medicine so development yeah, of therapy for example you know that's a massive contribution to the medical field so it's you know the scientists behind the scenes of medicine who do that mm. and then doctors get you know they get access to these therapies and they get to drive the clinical side of research and also you know just you know treatment of patients and that kind of thing but it's yeah. great being on the side where it's all built from scratch yeah I, th yeah. I think it's often glossed over a little bit um is that people often unfortunately forget that when i guess all these breakthroughs vaccines and new antibiotics and it, it's not doctors doing that <laughs> it's um yeah you've got the these huge... scientists yeah i mean it's they, we all work together essentially you know without the doctors you know who's going to deliver this treatment to the patients and but then without scientists how is this treatment going to come about to begin with so yeah. both are equally important fields i think excellent so the next set of questions that we have are they're all to do with with kind of the process and and the logistics of a phd itself and you kind of touched on this before but but let's let's say that you, you know you maria you did your your biomedical biomedical sciences degree and you did your masters um and you've decided i want to do a phd how do you go about you know beginning that process applying for the phds yes yes so um yeah so there's different ways you could apply for a phd so you can either search for them like there were jobs and apply for them uh you know with a cv and a personal statement mm -hmm. or you could find a supervisor and a lab where you want to do your phd in and then approach them and ask if they've got any opportunity for that uh which is what i did so i like I said before, I did apply for a couple of PhDs in that yes. kind of conventional way where um, I send my CV and my personal statement, have an interview, and then it's a yes or a no. Whereas for what the PhD I'm doing now, I got that through talking to the supervisor. I found, you know, I found his research interesting and I approached him saying, I'm really interested in this. I am doing a master's project in this kind of area. So my yeah. master's project had gamma delta T cell component in it. So I thought, oh my God, I really want to stay and do a PhD in that. And there was this one professor at my, there is one professor at my university who has a lab, you know, dedicated to gamma delta T cell research. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I thought this is perfect for me. Yeah. And yeah, so I approached him and I said, you know, I really want to stay here and do you have any opportunity? And he agreed because he was actually planning to um, submit for some kind of a PhD project. And what we ended up doing is applying for funding together, specifically yeah. for me to do that particular project. So, you know, there was this funding body. So I'm funded by Rose Trees Trust, which is something that funds um, translational orientated research. So kind of, you know, bench to bedside kind of research. So cancer immunotherapy kind of things. Sure. And um, yeah, so... That involved, you know, just, you know, my supervisor, obviously, he wrote the major proposal, but we kind of communicated a lot. I think every week we had a meeting to discuss, you know, where the PhD would go and if I'm happy with it. So we kind of edited it all together. And um, then eventually I had to submit. I also had to submit a CV and a personal statement as a candidate because sure. he named me a candidate on the application. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so that's another way of going about applying for PhD. And it totally works. Um, yeah. I think a lot of people kind of think, oh, I'm just going to apply to 10 different projects and then hope to get one of them. But it doesn't always work that way. So you really need to have an idea, at least of the field that you're interested in. Rather it, it than seems, just yeah, it sake. seems much yeah. more optimal to me based on what you've just said. You know, you were able, it seems to, if I understand you correctly, to directly choose what you ended up doing. Yeah rather yeah, than yeah. being at the whim of some third party who you know we're only going to fund you for a phd in this thing that you don't want to do yeah so a lot of people i mean the two phds i did apply for they were int really interesting so again but again i didn't want to apply just for you know 10 different projects yeah all in generally cancer immunology field because i thought i don't want to commit for three to four years of my life to something i don't know yeah. if i'm going to do or not Absolutely. Yeah, so whereas with this option, I could choose, you know, I said, okay, I really want this field. There is a person doing this research. I'm happy to come up to him and talk. And then that's, that can go really positively. 
you can some people can say no unfortunately i don't have anything at the moment but they will remember you for yeah. coming up to them and speaking so they might have an opportunity later on um yeah so it's definitely one of those things you should be ter- people should be terrified about you know approaching someone they like to work for yeah excellent well something that people are terrified about maria is is funding yeah. um, and you know la- lack of earnings so quite a few people asked and and I appreciate that this can probably also work in several different ways. Um, mm-hmm. How how does your PhD funding actually work? Um, so you, I get uh, so the grant that we have. So there's all sorts of type, different types of grants out there. So um, the PhD. So what I'm funded for is I have a stipend, and then which is my earning, and then I've got the separate bit of the funding dedicated for consumables so things like you know reagents in the lab and that kind of thing sure Um, so the stipends can vary greatly between different schemes so things like cancer schemes like cancer research uk pg studentships they can pay about nineteen thousand pounds a year which is like a nice salary sure uh, for a pg student but i think the minimum right now is 14 to 15,000 pounds a year is a minimum a PhD okay. stipend. Yeah, so I'm kind of in between that. I'm on 17 yeah. and a half K. Okay, um, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite so yeah, it's quite good. I'm above the minimum, which is nice. Um yeah, so it depends on the scheme, depends on the funding body. Um yeah, I think 19,000 pounds is the highest if I'm not mistaken. I could be wrong. I don't are, know. Are you are you sort of um it's difficult to ask, but are you are you you, you know, comfortable? Are you, are you living well on that you, you know, it, it, do you treat it like a job is it how do you perceive it in that way um it's uh yeah i mean phd research is a job it's a full-time job basically yeah like i said it's you're a student but you're not really you, it's not like you have assignments to write or exams to prepare for or small group teaching sessions to prepare for <laughs> if you're basically full-time in the lab and you can do other various other things around your research as well you can in get involved in student supervision but then you get paid for it as well so normally as an undergrad or master's you don't get paid as a student you kind of you have to pay your tuition fees whereas sure. being a phd your tuition fees are usually there are there are fees for phd students as well but they're usually covered by the university so i didn't even know they existed to be honest until we applied <laughs> for them. um yeah because nobody ever talks about it but yeah there are fees university pays for them you don't worry about it in terms of living um yeah, I personally, I live at home. So I'm quite lucky that Birmingham is my home city. So I've sure. always lived at home. Uh, but um, a lot of my friends, they don't live at home and they seem quite happy and comfortable just earning their PG stipend and having no other part-time jobs or anything like sure. that. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, then, well, I'll, I'll move this question because it probably fits better here. The question is, is if you won the lottery tomorrow the question doesn't specify how much but i'm I'm going to be generous and you know say you you win 10 million pounds tomorrow mm. are you carrying on with your phd uh wow it's i'll be honest it's a really <laughs> tough question that can actually get asked at phd interviews really so um yeah um i don't i don't know to be honest i i love my research work if i had that much money i'd probably invest in something um whether re- research related and non-research related but um yeah probably you know with that mo- that much money you could probably open up i don't know two labs and uh, run two different research groups and two labs with work. 10 million yeah. pounds <laughs> yeah that's, <laughs> that's a lot yeah um yeah i honestly don't know i'd still want to stay i'd still be in research but obviously i'd invest in something if i had you know yeah research yes but other things probably as well yeah, I saw I saw that question and I thought that's a really hard one to answer. <laughs> yeah, it's I'd not actually um thought about it too much myself. Um, yeah. But yeah, just to know yeah. you can get asked that to those people who are watching this, that you can get asked that kind of question at a PhD interview. I well, didn't get asked that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I got asked that once and I but I managed to kind of apply it to the lab setting. But I think now I probably would have answered it completely different. Well, um, let's let's go into that a little bit. So Obviously, I, I'm trying to to view this from from my perspective, where the the bulk of, of the audience that that watches my stuff are medics or people who who want to be medics, and 
medicine has a notorious selection process and and you know set of interview questions and things like that what do phd do you call them pis or supervisors what 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 do they you know what do they want to know about their potential students um oh so when the students are applying yes so pis yes principal investigators yes supervisors um so they want to see how if you're applying I don't know. So there's clinical PhD studentships for those for people like medics, and then there is non-clinical PhD studentships for people like myself who are just mm-hmm. from a some kind of scientific background. Um, so for um, non-scientific, non-clinical PhD, sorry, it's usually you know what lab experience you have, and mm-hmm. uh, also they would want to know why you want to do this PhD. So obviously there'll be it's quite a competitive process. So yeah. they want to make sure that the candidate definitely wants to do this PhD, not for the sake of doing a PhD, but because they're generally interested in the field. Yeah. They would probably be asking questions on the literature they've read and uh, to kind of, you know, following on from why you want to do this PhD, they'll be like, oh, what have you read about my research? Or have you seen any of the recent papers in this field? Um, yeah, I think for clinical PhDs, probably be a similar thing. Um, so they would obviously involve some kind of patient orientated work there. Mm. So I think the supervisors would want the same things, really. You know, what experience have you had? Why you want to do a PhD? What do you hope to gain from doing this PhD? Like, what, how would it help with your career, etc.? I think those are the main things they'd want to know. What do you want to gain from your PhD? Yeah, so uh, I mean, lab experience is the obvious thing, but again, that's something I've kind of gained already as I applied for PhD. Sure. Uh, well, for the main f- purpose of the PhD is that training that you get. So training to, you know, coordinate your own experiments. So when you start, you're more dependent. So you're kind of directed by your supervisor quite a lot. Sure. And uh, ask for questions. You ask a lot of questions, etc. But then eventually you get to the stage where you start to think of your own ideas and your own ways to progress your project. And then your supervisor is just there to kind of help you direct and, you know, tweak things a little bit, but he's not fully telling you what to do. So I'm hoping to, you know, get out of this PhD really is, you know, the ability to be more independent in terms of the thought process and the ideas that I make, I generate. Um, And obviously, you know, after such an extensive training, you know, you should be able to then apply for postdoctoral positions and, you know, then, where you're more independent and then eventually you become with more training, you become a PI yourself. Yeah. Do you want your so, own lab? To run your own lab. <laughs> yes. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to run my own lab uh, at the moment anyway. So I always say to people speak to me in about four years, three years time when I finish the PhD, because yeah. some people completely during the PhD, they decide, Oh, I don't want to be in an academic setting where you have to apply for grants and you're kind of always, you know, dependent on the funding. Some people decide to take off and go into pharmaceutical industry, for example, where it's more of a permanent job, I think. Um, yeah. You're not dependent on the grants and stuff, but at the moment, yes, I'm really interested in, I love the idea of research and the flexibility that it's your own ideas yeah. Um, I love the idea of being in an academic setting where you get to do teaching. So it's something that I really want to do as well, other than research. Excellent. Um, okay, great. So I think just just to make sure that we cover it properly and give it the, the due diligence that it deserves at the moment, mm-hmm. how has the, the current, um, the COVID global pandemic, how, how has that affected your assuming that you were based in the lab all the time, how has that affected your day to day? Yeah. So obviously the university of Birmingham has gone into this restricted operating mode now. So where basically all the labs, unless it's really, really essential work. So there are some labs which are actually helping with COVID-19 research, Hmm. but uh, most of the labs are shut down now. So we're not able to get in even. So our access is cancelled. Um, so yeah, I'm full-time working from home now, whereas Mm -hmm. before I was full-time working in a lab. Now I'm full-time just writing up and, (laughs) uh, doing some data analysis that I have. Yeah. And for writing up, writing up wise, it's mainly thesis writing and I've got this annual review report at the end of the year coming up. So I kind of have to prepare for that. Um, yeah, so I'm using this time basically because obviously I can't do any research, which is unfortunate. I really miss it already. But uh, I'm using this time to kind of productively, you know, write my thesis and write, um, you know, read, catch up on literature and that kind of th- do those kind of things. Um, 
But yeah, let's, so let me ask you about a thesis, sorry, because um, yeah. it's this term that's getting bandied around. Many people, if they're maybe undergrads or um, whatever, won't know, you know, what, what is a PhD thesis? Why is it so important? So, yeah, PhD thesis is basically, so undergrads would know about it as a dissertation, maybe. So like in, the, in your final year biomed undergrad, for example, the, in the course that I did, I had to do an eight week laboratory project and then write that up into a dissertation. So, and your PhD thesis is basically like um, a really big three to four times the thickness of your undergrad dissertation kind of sure. thesis. Yeah, so it's, um, so you've got introduction section, which is the background of all your uh, project and everything you've done. Then you've got your materials and methods, which is all the experimental techniques that you've done throughout your PhD. And then you've got the chapters of your results. So usually there's more than one chapter of results. Um, so the chapters are quite big, obviously. You've got three to four years worth of data there. So um, yeah, you basically write your results, um, have your figures there and you have discussion. I think you have discussion section pair results chapter and then you've got like an overall discussion as a separate chapter altogether where you're okay. kind of relating research to what, what's, you know, what's out there currently in the literature and how you would progress your research further. Um, so like future perspectives kind of section, basically. Yeah. And then you've got your references as you go through, et cetera. So you reference any literature you've referenced, you've got it there. But yeah, you've got, I, I think it's about this thick, the your PhD thesis, usually. Oh, God. So it's, you know, three to four years of your work, you can imagine it's a lot of data. Um, so, yeah. Well, so then do you, do you just... Um you know, let's say you get to the end of your four years and you've written up your, your, your big chunky thesis, then it, do you, you know, do you get your PhD? Kind of what, what happens then? So with, so in the UK, you have to have a viva. A lot of the time, in a lot of countries, you have to have a viva, which is like an oral defense of your PhD thesis. So it's basically a panel of two examiners, uh, one internal and one external. So internal examiner is somebody who is from your university. There would be somebody who works on T cells or some kind of immuno cancer immunology angle. And an external examiner also from the same field, but from elsewhere. So any other university in the UK or maybe outside the UK even. So they come and they basically question everything you've done in your thesis. So they go through, they usually come in and they've got like little sticky notes everywhere. And you kind of have to, it's basically a discussion of what you've done and why you've done it and you know why is it important that you've done it basically um yeah it's, it usually lasts about three hours on average some last four to five hours it really depends oh, some are like, the shortest one. <laughs> shortest one is about two and a half hours that i've heard of actually oh. yeah so it's it's an interesting process i think people get terrified because they treat it as an exam yeah. whereas I had a viva for my master's as well. So my MRES involved a one hour viva at the end. So I had to write a thesis as well. It's about, it's much shorter, but it's also a thesis. I had to write that and defend it in the end. And I really enjoyed that actually. It's nice to talk about your work and yeah. because sometimes it's, yeah, you clarify everything in writing, but you know, when people, some people still won't get it. So it's nice to kind of, you know, verbally explain it all to them and show your enthusiasm for all the work that you've done. Yeah. Yeah. Some countries, don't have a viva so i think some countries you just write a longer thesis and somehow you know it gets assessed um some other by some other means and then that's it you that you're told that you've passed uh, so it's a pass or fail you either you either pass with minor corrections so for the viva you either pass with minor corrections which is you know tiny little edits you have to do to like resubmit your thesis quickly yeah yeah and then you can pass with major corrections which is normally you know, I don't know, you, you reduce an experiment or two or something. So it's usually in the extreme cases, most of the time it's passed with minor corrections, which is not a problem. You basically, yeah. that's it, you've got your PhD. And then you can very, very, very rarely you can fail. So it's, I don't know what you need to do to fail. You have to be not aware of what you're doing for the whole of the four years. <laughs> for four for years. <laughs> yes. You would have, have to not see your supervisor at all. And I don't know what happens, you know, when people fail, but it does happen. It's very rare. So more, more often than not, you pass with minor corrections. And once you know you've passed, that's it. You can say you've got your PhD. That's you it, just have yeah. to graduate at the end, basically. And that's it. And yeah. your doctor. So and, and your so. doctor, yes. So <laughs> usually after the viva, everybody's like, I'm a doctor now. <laughs> God. Yeah. They're just being grilled for four hours by academics on, yes. on my experiments. Um, yeah. Excellent. I mean, that will be 
I think particularly that the fact that most of them are successful, that'll be very reassuring to people. Yeah. I have a feeling that a lot of these questions, just by the looks of the ones we've got left, came from undergrads by the mm-hmm. looks of things. Um, so someone has asked, is it possible to undertake lab work or maybe get a part-time lab job while you're at university? You can, so as an undergrad, uh, you can do um, placements in different labs. So what I did, so I did after my second year biomed, I contacted one of the lecturers in the field of microbiology, asking if I could possibly do a lab placement with him, just to get, you know, some hands-on experience with lab work before doing my final year dissertation project, because that's obviously the biggest chunk of your final year. So I thought I want some experience beforehand to see what lab is like, basically. So you do your practical works as you go along on your degree, but it's not really good representative of what actual research is. Sure. So I spent about six weeks in a lab um, doing you know, the various um, experiments with the PhD students in the lab at the time. You can do that and get paid as well. So it depends on the situation. So for me, because I lived at home, I wasn't classed as the priority person for funding. So uh, yeah, yeah, there, yeah. there are funding schemes at universities usually who are happily going to fund your placement time. Uh, but yeah, I think the, somebody in my course, they managed to get a grant for the eight weeks or whatever she spent in the lab. So she actually got paid for being here because she's not from Birmingham. Sure. She's from you know, London or somewhere that way. Um, yeah, so she actually got paid whilst doing that placement. So yeah, in short, yes, you can get paid lab placements as an undergrad during university. What was that? I mean, you say sort of six weeks. I mean, was that over a over a summer or you know you know the, the oh, holiday? Oh yes, that was in yeah. summer. Yes, that was in summer. Yes, so after all the exams are done, etc., you've got two two months or whatever of summer. Yes. So you can't do what you want with it, really. Um, so I decided, yes, yeah, six weeks was kind of good enough for me. So you don't have to do it for six weeks. You can do for eight to ten weeks, depending on the lab and if they can accommodate you for that long. Sure. I said, yeah. no, I was just wondering. I was trying to think, how are people fitting this into oh, yeah, a, yeah, no, an not undergrad during degree? Your studies, yeah, not during yeah. your studies. Um, yeah, you can't do that during your studies. Um, someone has asked, uh, th- this is, um, so you're speaking to us from home. Um, how, do you, how do you find the motivation to work, you know, while, while being at home? How do, you, how do you manage your time when you're not in the lab? Yeah, so I am, I'm quite organised in general so I like to make kind of lists of things that I like to do in the day not like I'm, I'm going to spend this many hours doing this this many hours doing that no not that way so I prefer to just have like a tick list of things okay today I'm going to work on I don't know introduction for my thesis for example yeah and spend you know some time doing that and then maybe do a couple of other things you know go through some data analysis etc so if I don't have any kind of idea of what I need to do every day, so if I don't have the list of things that I'm doing, then it can be quite weird for me because I don't, I feel like I'm a bit lost. I have no direction. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah. Um, so yeah, help having the list of things to do definitely helps with that. And also things like, you know, taking regular breaks as well. So that helps because I can't work just, you know, hours on end without a break. So I need a break. I need to, you know, chat with my family or I don't know, watch a film or I don't know read or just take my eyes out of you know PhD and all that work yeah um yeah so I yeah just kind of you know switching activities and having a plan having a plan definitely helps it doesn't have to be tick list it's whatever you like it to be but if you have an idea of what you want to do in a day don't plan like 20 things to do because it will be quite hard to follow and then you'll be quite stressed I think so you know have you know a few tick points like maximum five I think and then try and get them done in a day and then that's it you can do you know once you've ticked them it's very satisfying to tick things off the list definitely sure. so once you've done it once you've done it uh, you, you know you can chill you can do whatever you want with your day <laughs> awesome um what are you reading at the moment on that note yeah. so i'm on the uh, goldfinch at the moment by donna tart so um I, I started that some time ago actually but i kind of got into my lab work a lot and i left it for a bit so I'm, i've actually got the time now to catch up on the reading that i started yeah so i've just i'm on like third chapter at the moment so yeah oh excellent yeah um and then the last that i guess the last um the last major question that we've got here is what advice do you have for someone who is starting their scientific career? 
to, when start starting your career really so have an idea what you know why you're so for i don't know applying for a phd for example why you want to do a phd and do you need to do a phd so scientific careers can be can go in all sorts of ways you can go into academia you can go into industry you can do something that's scientific like scientific writing or publishing and uh, you don't have to have phds or sometimes you don't want to have to have a master's for them so really have a look into what you want to do career wise uh, because that will help direct your studies and any other, you know, things that you need to do to achieve that goal. Um, also, if it's research you're interested in, then have an idea of what field interests you, because again, that would help you with picking where you want to specialize and where you want to kind of carry on. So if uh, it doesn't have to be a very specific focus, so it can be just a general, I don't know, genetics or immunology or cancer or whatever. So if you have sure. some kind of idea of what you want to do, then that would really help you. Um, also, just, you know, ask, you know, don't be afraid to approach people if you're interested in a particular opportunity in a particular place. You know, don't be afraid to contact people directly and ask, you know, have you got an opportunity, whether it's lab or non-lab based. Uh, because I think it usually works, usually it works quite well. People may not reply straight away, but they will remember that you've contacted them and they'll, you know, when they have an opportunity, they might actually get back to you. So um, I think, yeah, be be proactive in this, definitely. Excellent. I think that's probably good advice, whatever anyone wants to do, isn't it? Okay, perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Maria, for chatting to us. Um, thank you this very will much. Go, to go live very soon. And I'm sure it'll have been very very useful it's been really good to hear from a, a proper scientist during <laughs> during these um difficult difficult times yeah um, yeah it's definitely it's it's nice too so i found it quite you you know at the time like i said you know i didn't know what science or research research was about really so i think it's it's quite nice to actually you know go out there and tell people what it is all about yeah. so you know that, they're not in a position where they have no idea what it is basically yeah fantastic okay um oh we've not even talked about but we'll direct people your way yeah. how can people keep up with your your doings and what you're getting up to yes yeah, so i have a blog on instagram it's called research diaries so it's uh, at research.diaries so you can follow me there um i basically i write about my lab life and about you know my career journey and uh, i do quite a few things on student advice usually during certain times of the year and you know if people ask me to i like to kind of post things about that so whether it's personal statements or applying for masters or just you know general studenty kind of advice yeah so do follow me on that um i will answer your questions and uh you know happily tell you everything about me <laughs> and what i do so yeah perfect i mean uh, the um the links to all your, your various social media channels we'll make sure they're in the um in the attached description um to this video and hopefully we will speak to you again soon yeah, yeah, I really enjoy that. So yeah, hopefully we'll chat again. So okay, thanks very much, Maria. Take care. Yeah, thank you, Ollie. Thanks for watching, guys. There are three ways you can support the channel. The first one is to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with a friend. Just enjoy it generally. Second, is you can buy me a coffee if you found it useful using my Ko-Fi link, which will help keep me awake during the editing process. And then thirdly, you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020 my favourite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.